So we aren't far away from the release of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, a new Amazon Prime TV show set in the world of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. And this will be the first on-screen Tolkien adventure for the better part of a decade since it's been like eight years since the last Hobbit movies. And even then, the Hobbit movies weren't that well received, but you know, I guess it's what happens when you take the source material and change it a lot for the movies as a prequel to a series that was really well known for sticking very closely to the source material. I mean, the original Lord of the Rings trilogy even released extended editions of the movies just so that you'd have something that was even closer to what the books were. But you'll notice something interesting in my wording there. I referred to the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings trilogy as the original trilogy, but that's not entirely true. Because in the late 70s, a series of three animated movies composed a trilogy that adapted not only the Lord of the Rings, but The Hobbit as well. And they did it entirely on accident. Kind of. Obviously, these movies were not made by accident. The people who made them made them very intentionally because they wanted to make a movie. But the fact that they are a trilogy is actually an accident because these movies weren't all made by the same company. Two of them were made by one company and one of them was made by a different company. The Hobbit was produced by Rankin Bass Productions, who you may know from a bunch of Christmas classics like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, A Year Without a Santa Claus, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, The Little Drummer Boy, Rudolph's Shiny New Year, Here Comes Peter the Cottontail, uh, The Ballad of Smokey the Bear, Frosty's Winter Wonderland, The Little Drummer Boy Book 2, Jack Frost, Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July, The Leprechaun's Christmas Gold, Pinocchio's Christmas, The Easter Bunny is Coming to Town, Nestor the Long-Eared Christmas Donkey, and many, 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 more. Rankin Bass is a company that no longer exists and all of their assets are now owned by Warner Brothers, who also own New Line Cinema, who are the producers of the Lord of the Rings films. The Hobbit was actually pretty well received, and if you can track it down, it's a really good movie, honestly. And at an hour and 15 minutes, it's a, a, a much more efficient way to watch The Hobbit play out. Now, I'm, I'm a very casual Tolkien fan, but just from me watching it, it looks like they didn't cut out too much. It just looks like they like, like shortened things and kind of glossed over parts that weren't really important to the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's a lot shorter than the Jackson movies, let's just put it like that. And it's definitely a step up from the 1967 Hobbit movie, which if you haven't checked that out, go watch it, it's a trip. Arthur Rankin really wanted to make a Hobbit movie because he was a big fan of Tolkien's work, but apparently something that helped was that through some weird legal loophole at the time, The Hobbit, as a book, was actually in the public domain. So anybody could make a Hobbit movie or a radio series or comic book or whatever. Please don't try that now. It's been resolved that you will face legal action. However, while The Hobbit was in the public domain, the Lord of the Rings books weren't. So they made this movie and at the same time, they were doing it to avoid the fact that all these other companies were vying for the film rights to the Lord of the Rings. Most notably, United Artists, who had the rights at the time. So a year after Rankin Bass had their crack at the Tolkien mythology, a new Lord of the Rings movie was released by United Artists, a company that no longer exists and is now owned by Warner Brothers, who apparently has a yearly budget for Hitman to take out all these competing companies. This film was just called The Lord of the Rings, and it was an adaptation of The Fellowship of the Ring and the first half, roughly, of The Two Towers. At the time of release, though, there was already a sequel adapting the remainder of The Two Towers and all of The Return of the King, creating this two-movie epic of The Lord of the Rings Part 1 and The Lord of the Rings Part 2. And this movie had been in development at United Artists for like 10 years, and it was only until Ralph Bakshi signed on as director in 1975 that things really started getting rolling with it. So it was pretty much just a complete coincidence that The Lord of the Rings happened to come out a year after an adaptation of The Hobbit. And so purely by coincidence, 
The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings Part 1, and Lord of the Rings Part 2 would create a trilogy adapting all four books. Unlike The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings was actually released theatrically. Also unlike The Hobbit, it wasn't traditionally animated in the sense that it was actually rotoscoped. What is rotoscoping, you ask? Well, this all goes back to the early days of animated film and both asks and answers the question, why is the medium of animation often considered a children's genre? So, as animation got started in the early 20th century, it was discovered that animating people was really tricky. While drawing humans usually turned out fine, it was difficult to animate them in a way that didn't invoke the uncanny valley effect. Humans have evolved to be able to recognize other figures as human for, you know, survival reasons, and when humans see things that are almost human, but just barely inhuman, it's disturbing and uncomfortable to look at. Think creepypastas and horror movies that often distort the appearance of humans rather than create things from scratch. It triggers something deep inside of us to make our skin crawl. This is called the uncanny valley effect. It's the reason, for example, that some people are afraid of clowns. Clowns look human for the most part, but their pale skin, large smiles, and big feet makes them appear just barely inhuman, and that, that's pretty scary. And when hand-drawn animation studios would animate humans, it was very hard to do it in a way that the humans had just the right proportions and moved in a way that was recognizably human. So they found it was more pleasing to the eye to draw animals, often anthropomorphized, and because the characters were animals, animation became targeted towards kids. And even now, where the uncanny valley isn't nearly the issue it was back in the day, many people still consider animation kids' entertainment. But, in 1915, an animator named Max Flesher developed a patented technique to make human characters move realistically and fluidly on the screen. This entailed basically filming the sequences that would be difficult to animate, and then projecting the footage onto glass and drawing over top of it to make sure the animation was realistic and fluid. This technique was called the Flesher process at the time, though it would eventually be known as rotoscoping when Max Flesher lost the patent in 1934, allowing other studios to use it. Notably, Disney often used rotoscoping for some difficult sequences in their traditionally animated movies, and would employ actors to act out the scenes on barebone sets and in costume for animators to reference and draw over top of. And a large portion of The Lord of the Rings was actually filmed in live action with actors in costumes with props on sets so that they could be animated over. This painstaking process allowed for the complexity and detail of live-action films to be felt in animation while also saving costs. <sighs> Sorry, I get really excited about this kind of stuff. So back to the main story here. The Lord of the Rings was originally titled The Lord of the Rings Part 1, with Part 2 already scheduled for release in 1980. However, The Lord of the Rings Part 2 would only actually be produced and complete the trilogy if Lord of the Rings Part 1 did well. And so, with no promise of a part two, they didn't want to call the film part one. They didn't think people would pay to see half a movie, uh, and so it was just called The Lord of the Rings. And maybe that was the right call, because after the movie was released in 1978, there was no sequel. The movie did modestly well, but reviews weren't great, and it wasn't enough money to have a big budget sequel really on the table. On top of that, there were a lot of behind-the-scenes arguments about how they would go about making a second film. So the sequel was never made. But in 1980, in place of The Lord of the Rings Part 2, Rankin Bass released a new Tolkien movie as a follow-up to The Hobbit. And that movie was called The Return of the King. So in 1977, they made an adaptation of The Hobbit. Then in 1978, United Artists released an adaptation of The Fellowship of the Ring and The Two Towers. And then in 1980, Rankin Bass released an adaptation of The Return of the King. So if you watch all three movies back to back, it creates a trilogy that encompasses all four books. And it was a complete accident. And I know what you're thinking. Surely, Rankin Bass did this on purpose. They saw that Lord of the Rings 2 wasn't happening, so they thought it'd be redundant to make a follow-up to The Hobbit that adapted The Fellowship of the Ring anyway, so they just made The Return of the King so that you could have more material and 
figure most of the people watching had seen The Lord of the Rings anyway. They'd have a follow-up to The Hobbit and also be able to finish what Ralph Bakshi and the people at United Artists had started. But this isn't true. So remember how I said the whole reason The Hobbit was made was because of a weird legal loophole at the time that meant the book was in the public domain? Well, through the same legal loophole at the time, The Return of the King was in the public domain, but The Fellowship of the Ring and The Two Towers weren't. So again, the only thing Rankin Bass could legally do as a follow-up to The Hobbit was an adaptation of The Return of the King. It was just a coincidence that it happened to follow the release of The Lord of the Rings. In fact, writing and storyboarding for The Return of the King actually was already going on while The Lord of the Rings was finishing up production and getting ready for release. United Artists actually tried to get The Return of the King cancelled, but they couldn't because again, the book was in the public domain, so they had no power over whether or not a movie was made. Which I guess is the reason why The Lord of the Rings isn't in the title of The Return of the King. It's just The Return of the King, because The Lord of the Rings as a name was copyrighted, but The Return of the King as a book wasn't. So it really was a complete accident that this trilogy was made. And it works. Like, if you watch all three movies in a row, it works. Anyway, let me know what you think of these movies if you've seen them. Uh, if you haven't seen them, go check them out. Uh, and let me know your memories about The Lord of the Rings if you're going to be watching The Rings of Power. Thank you all for watching this video. Uh, see you later.